Good morning. Welcome to Valley Grace and welcome to those of you that are joining us via live stream. We are so thankful that you are with us today. Um, and let's go ahead and stand so we can worship together. Some glad morning when this life is over. One of my kids was struggling with some fears surrounding death. I'm sure that's something that we can all um, understand. And um, because it's scary and it's unknown and you don't know what will happen, um, but we were able to speak to her about God's power over death. And so because of Jesus's power and because of his death on the cross, he has the ultimate victory and we can have peace. Knowing that the creator of the universe cares for us and is in control. So as we sing this next song, um, I pray that we all can just rest in this peace of our future and eternity with Jesus.
compassion and your love for us. And Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is truly so good to us. to us always, and God, that you love us so much. Lord, this weekend specifically, we think of sacrifice. Lord, we uh, appreciate a nation where um, many have given their lives and sacrificed for this country and our freedom to worship you. And so, Lord, we 
reflect on this, we think about your sacrifice through your son. And God, we just can't stop thinking of your goodness through it. Lord, just thank you for everything that you've given to us. And it's all in your wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Whoa, a little hot there, Steve. There we go. Glad to have you here on this holiday weekend. Those again joining us uh, live on uh, live stream, thank you for attending as well. Just a couple quick announcements. One is Bible school is coming up just uh, in a few more weeks. We would like you to register, even if you're an adult that's helping. Uh, if you can just go to um, valleygraceevents.net, you can register your children, you can register as, a, as an adult there. Uh, but our theme is, um, is an investigation into the character of God. And uh, for anybody, uh, kids three years old through fifth grade, uh, Barb's got a pretty good staff, but we can always use some more help with that. So valleygraceevents.net and just click on the link there um, and I'll let you register for that. So good, thanks for coming. We're going to address something that got me in trouble a number of years ago. Well, let's pray first and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. Lord, thanks for your word. And this morning, uh, Lord, even as Jacob uh, just prayed, but Lord, we thank you for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And Lord, there may be some here who um, had husbands or wives or sons or daughters who made that sacrifice. And Lord, we thank you for um, their willingness as well uh, to allow their loved ones to be a part of preserving the freedoms uh, that we enjoy here. But Lord, we also thank you uh, for the moms. I know it's not Mother's Day, uh, but Lord, this morning as we think about moms and stepmoms and grandmoms, and uh, Lord, it's just, uh, it's amazing how you have and continue to use um, those women in the lives of your people. So give us direction as we look at your word today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, throughout the years, a popular topic among comedians has been, did you hear the one about the mother-in-law who, and in fact, years ago, I had just finished telling the kind of Barb's family my favorite mother-in-law joke, only to realize she was standing right behind me. <laughs> and all I heard was, Douglas? 
whether you're growing up or whatever, when you hear Doug Less, you know you're in trouble. Uh, you'll have to ask me later for what that joke is. I don't want that on uh, recorded here, but <laughs> it's, it's clean. It's just you. Mothers-in-law have gotten a lot of bad publicity, but we, we did marry their sons or daughters, and so they can't be all that bad. This morning, we want to focus our attention on the importance and the impact that mothers, mothers-in-law, and wives have on their family and on their husbands. I want to look at one Bible story. Let me give you a couple disclaimers. One is that we're not going to be able to address some of the little rabbit trails that we would really like to in this story. The second is this story was not written originally to be a primer on marriages and relationships and families. But when we see the interaction of this mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, there's some things we can learn. Just realize that we are pulling these um, as an example that wasn't the original intent. So those are my disclaimers. Most of you are going to know the story. We know uh, the, the one woman as the woman who changed her name, who suffered repeated personal loss, but had an amazing impact on at least one daughter-in-law. In fact, the daughter-in-law is more famous than her mother-in-law. Apart from Naomi's influence, the story of Ruth would probably have never made the pages of Scripture. So I think that Naomi really does illustrate some things about mothering and mother-in-law-ing, even though my spell check didn't like mother-in-law-ing, but you know what I'm talking about. I want to follow the kind of same general um, application outline that Pastor Dan did last week, this time with moms, namely, what's the value that women bring to marriage and to their home, their sons, their daughters? So it's a popular story in the Old Testament, but I think it'll still be good for us to review. So if you have Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter, no Luke, <laughs> how about Ruth chapter 1? Pew Bible, I did look this up, it's page 278, if you have one of the Pew Bibles, but Ruth chapter 1, we're going to look at several sections in Ruth 1, then I'm going to kind of summarize 2 and 3, and then we're going to jump over to 4. Just again, to get the background, if you, if you haven't read this book in a long time, or if you're not familiar with this story, so Ruth chapter 1. Now, it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Uh, uh, Kilion, <coughs> uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now, they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilian also died, and the woman was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Let's just pause there for a minute. Famines were very, very popular, uh, very common in the land of of Israel. This famine, however, lasted so long that they, they couldn't just wait it out. And so they had to move to Moab. I'm going to show you a map in just a minute uh, where that's at. It's actually probable that this famine took place uh, around the time of uh, Judges chapter 6. In Judges 6, the land was being devastated by the, the Midianites. They oppressed uh, Israel for about seven years. Um, but if you look at uh, kind of Boaz is going to be a main character a little bit later in this book, that seems to fit well with a, um, uh, Judges chapter 6 and the Judge Gideon who's going to come about and, to, and bring some reform. So 10 years pass and, uh, in Moab, and in that time she's lost her husband and both sons. So it has really been a rough transition. You're kicked out of your home. Now your husband and both sons pass. Finally, Naomi has some good news from home. And this is going to bring us to kind of our first principle about uh, mothers and wives. And I know that Naomi is a mother-in-law, but just for brevity, I'm just going to say moms. Okay? Luke chapter 1, let's continue in verse 6. 
Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So what was Naomi trying to do? Here's sort of the point. Naomi was trying to put her family in the place where God was blessing. She realized that now God had stepped back in, probably again under um, the judge Gideon, and things were looking up in Israel. God was blessing. He had remembered his, his children there. Naomi hears that story, and the principle is we need to figure out where God is blessing and move our families that direction, even if that means sacrifice. I want to show you a couple of pictures here, and actually, I'm just going to use a pointer. Michael, I'm going to let you advance, so... Um, here is, there we go, uh, here's Bethlehem, they're going to come back to Bethlehem, so this is sort of talking about their return trip, they're going to come back to Bethlehem because uh, Boaz is um, from Bethlehem, this is the whole area of Moab, but the, the terms that they use in here probably means that they were just over in here, so this is of course the Dead Sea. So what I thought I'd do is pull up Google Earth to see what does that look like, okay? So here's a, here's a Google Earth. So again, they would have been coming around here. They would have been going across this to Bethlehem. And what does especially this area look like? Three women traveling alone. They would have had to go through this. Next, yeah. Look at those not so fun kind of mountains through that whole area. So uh, we're really kind of starting from here, cutting across there. This would not have been an easy trip for them. So she knew, though, that that's where she needed her family to be. So how is it that we find out where God's blessing and move our family that direction? Let me think, first of all, about uh, a mom. Um, oh, my other disclaimer, and I actually had this in the notes. Um, please, women, don't assume that I am saying at all. I think Dan made the same dis disclaimer last week. We are not saying that moms have more value than non-moms or that married women have more value than unmarried women. Okay, we're not, making, we're not saying that at all. Okay, it's just our topic today is moms and wives. Okay, so continue here. <clears throat> So how do we then find out where God is blessing and then move our family that direction? Well, one of the things, and um, you're going to hear a few stories. I tried to limit my stories of our family to, to just a few. But one of the things that we try to do is to expose our family to uh, godly people who are in ministries that God has been blessing. We try to have missionaries in our home as often as we possibly could if they could spend the night that was great uh, we sent our children to places where we knew god was blessing uh, why is it that uh, this year's momentum will be i think my 35th year i'm not counting last year but otherwise 35 years in a row why do i keep going back to momentum because it's a place that god has chosen to bless and to change the lives of people. And so we tried, whether it would be Urban Hope, and many of you have been to Urban Hope, um, some activity where we know God is blessing there, and we just want to be a part of that. Okay? My kids, as they've moved all around the country and the world, in trying to find churches, they're trying to find churches that it's obvious God is moving, and let's put our kids there. So it's really important that you put, uh, you put your kids your family uh, in a place where God blesses. So how can a wife do that? Again, give him the same opportunities. So uh, some of you men have been on missions trips uh, without your wives, and I know that that means that's extra work on the wives. It just is, okay? Um, and so, again, just to provide an opportunity for your husbands to grow. Let's get back to Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, we're still there. Uh, we want to pick up another Another thing that I see in Naomi, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. 
May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept and they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. Realized they, both, both women at this time were saying that. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should, I, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that you may have husband, that, that uh, may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I said, I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it's harder for me than for you. For the land of the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. She's being very honest. Life has been really hard. And from a human perspective, the best thing that she could recommend to these two ladies is go back home. Now, this is one of those rabbit trails I like to follow. We don't have time to. And that is, why would Naomi send these two girls back to a pagan culture? Okay, you can ponder that one, but we don't have really time to address that. At least from a human perspective, that is bad. Her logic is, is okay. okay. Because of the traditions, um, she would have to have another husband. They would have to have children. Those boys would have to be old enough then to marry because they kind of have to keep that in the family. So she's thinking our normal custom and tradition is not going to work. The best thing to do is for you to go back home. You're both way young enough uh, to be able to find husbands. Um, so that really is the best for them. And so what I think I see in Naomi here is that uh, moms and wives really do seek for the best of their families. Now what that looks like can get interesting. So what, is that, what does that mean? Oh, and by the way, think of, of Naomi. If it's tough going across those mountains as three women... Imagine you're going across the mountains as a one woman, a little bit older. So what's involved in a mom doing what's best for her family? Uh, let me just list a few. Uh, and Barb was just so good at these kinds of things. Um, helping them to learn how to develop their own walk with Christ. That was really important um, to, to Barb and I both. Um, but your kids have to develop their own walk with Christ. One of the things that you can do is don't freak out when they start questioning things. Okay? Uh, I still remember when some, and there's one of my kids in particular, that just went through a time, just, okay, I know what mom and dad have said. It, is that what I really think? And if you freak out, then they're going to shut down. The conversation's over. They still are going to have those questions. They're just not going to have you as a resource to help them think those through. So I think one of the things that's really for the good of the family is to help them develop their own walk with Christ. Because until each of us think through our own answers to the big questions, then Christianity is not their own. Okay? They have to answer those. Um, what are some other things? Um, helping them decide how to best spend their time. Limiting time on video games, what movies they can watch. That was always a big contention because we had rules about what movies uh, the kids could watch. And, uh, and that same child told me what movie this child was, I won't even use he or her, uh, what movie this child was going to see. And I found out later that's not the movie that this child went to see. Big trouble at home. You are still the parents. You're still the mom. You still have the authority to say, you're not allowed. That's, that's not in the realm of, at your age, at this time, this is not what we want you to do. Uh, learning how to date. I tell everybody, don't date the way I did. I dated the first gal for 18 months, the next gal for four years, and I'm still dating the third one. I don't think that was the best way to do it. I really do think you need to get to know different people, um, but that's just not the way I'm wired. Uh, but here's where Barb, Barb did such a great job at this, because um, my family, we don't have time to go into it. I was, I was raised very differently than Barb. Let's just say it that way, okay? Um, very differently. 
Okay. Mom and dad didn't care who I went out with, what time I came home. They, they didn't care any of that stuff. Uh, graciously, the Lord had built some of those safeguards. I was a believer by the time I was, I was dating. And so um, there were some safeguards that the Lord just, the Holy Spirit just built into me. Uh, but Barb was really good about saying, um, okay, I must see your face by 11 o'clock. Which means that, that Ben, um, his girlfriend, was uh, about five miles away. He knew exactly when he had to leave her house to pull into our driveway by 11 o'clock. So, moms, you just keep some standards with that. Okay? Um, help them explore opportunities that God might offer them and where he might be leading them. Some of the toughest things we ever had to do, I can still remember it. Karen, our oldest, she was 18 at the time. We dropped her off in front of her dorm at Grace College in Indiana and drove away. And I'm, <laughs> I get teared up just thinking about it. I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and she's just standing there. Doesn't really know anybody, but knows that's where God wanted her to go to school. She has some quizzing friends, but we're driving six hours home. She also didn't make it easy. Just a few years later, she had graduated from Grace. We're standing um, at the ticket, or we're standing at the gate at uh, Reagan, and she's going to Africa for a year. And then <clears throat> I couldn't turn around. We, we left her there, and we just had to walk and just keep walking down the, down the thing there. But both times, Barb and I knew that is, God needed to... For her to have that experience, she had a wonderful experience in, in Africa. Learned Sango in like two months. I mean, just crazy kind of stuff. But worked with orphans, worked with some things there. Still had, still's involved somewhat to there. But those, those were really, really hard. Or, or Ben, my youngest, uh, calls us up one day, said, Hey, um, can you be home at 2 o'clock to meet the recruiter? Said, Sure. Ben is a great athlete, uh, state competition, first place winner cross country and all kinds of stuff. So we had certain assumptions and we pull in there and there's a marine recruiter. Not a college recruiter. <laughs> and Barb said, when did you decide to be a marine? He said, I told you when I was seven, I just haven't changed my mind. <laughs> but he really believed that's where God wanted him. So it's like, okay. And then he said, oh, and by the way, I'm signing up to be a sniper. It's hard to let your kids explore where they think God wants to move them. Um, the, the reverse of what we did, there's a teen, I still know this family, still a good family. She was called to missions. Every gifting, every interest... And mom shut that down, and she never went. Moms, you have a huge impact in allowing kids to explore what God wants to do with them. And I think, uh, I think Naomi did that. So what's involved in a wife doing what's best in your relationship for her husband? I could say a lot, most of which I'd get in trouble, so I'm going to just leave it at this. Be the most godly person you can be. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, don't worry, I don't have these verses up there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? The context there is that, um, that you have an influence, and when they watch, who knows how the Lord will use that to, to change their thinking about Christianity. It is not unusual. I don't recommend, and I think it's unbiblical for a, a saved and an unsaved person to date and to get married, but God is a gracious God, and there have been husbands who've come to Christ because of a godly wife and the other way around. Um, this is, um, I don't quote this to my wife. She quotes it back to me. It's better to live in a corner roof than a house uh, shared with a contentious woman. Yeah, I know better not to share that with her, but she will quote that saying, this is, this is what I'm working on, okay? So they look out for the good of their family. That can be tough. That can be at a real personal 
emotional sacrifice, but we have to be able to do that. Uh, thirdly, we're back in, in uh, Ruth again. This is also a difficult one. Mothers and wives encourage independence and thinking. So Ruth 1, verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Why do I say it encourages independent uh, actions and thinking? Because she really placed the decision-making on those, those women. She gave them the options, but she really did say, in a sense, it, it's your decision. And I think that's a major responsibility, is that we need to build in our children, move them toward greater and greater independence. And that is so difficult. What we want is when they are adults, that they are responsible adults and can contribute to society. This is really tough for parents, especially moms, because so many of you are very nurturing, and when they start to step out of, of that where they need your direct nurturing, that's, that's just really hard. So the decision was up to the girls. That also implies you have to live with the decisions your children make. If you have adult children, you know this next sentence is probably the most true thing I've said. It is hard to parent adult children. It is crazy hard to parent adult children. When they're younger, you say, do that. I don't, want I don't care. I'm dad. I'm mom. Just do it. When they're 32, you can't really do that anymore. Um, so these are adult women. So Naomi gives them uh, the option. And Orpah decided to go back. Okay? That's the last we hear of her. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, these are Jewish scholars. Um, it is not in the scripture whatsoever. But according to rabbinic tradition, Orpah became the mother of four warriors of Gath, one of whose name you'll probably recognize, Goliath. According to Jewish tradition, she became the mother of Goliath, and she allegedly died at the hands of David and his servants in battle. So for Orpah, the things didn't end well. Now remember, that's Jewish tradition. It's not stated, so I just found that interesting. So how do you moms help your children depend, um, promote independence in thinking and in actions? Uh, one, and this, this is again, Barb and I were raised very differently, and so um, it comes in play here. Certainly, age with age-appropriate safeguards in place, let your kids explore the world. Barb came home one, home one day, and we were all on the roof of the house. <laughs> Why not? I mean, we had a ladder. We went up there. I went up first. They climbed up. I grabbed their hand. We're all just kind of sitting and walking around the roof of the house. She's going... Why, are my, why is my husband and all four of my kids on the roof of our house? Why not? Okay. I thought I had pretty good safeguards and, I, and nobody got hurt, but, you know, let them climb on the rock pile. Let them pole vault. That's about the most dangerous thing I can think of in track and field. Okay, so just, whew, those are hard. You just got to let them, let them do that, okay? You just need to be there uh, if they fail to, uh, to pick them back up and help them. Keep going. Um, encourage their opinions. Uh, just one quick story here, um, and it's helpful that I don't, my watch doesn't work right now. No, it did. Um, <laughs> so we had a dog. We wanted this to be an outside dog. We have a shed. We cut a nice gate in the shed so the dog could go in the shed. First night, dog wanted no part of being outside at all during the night. So now I have a hole in the shed. Now, we at least kept the, what we'd cut out. So we're getting ready to put that back in. And uh, my oldest son, Dave, I said, so Dave, how do you think we should hook that back in to make it look the best? And actually, his idea was better than mine. <laughs> so we took it. But, but the idea is, okay, Dave, you are, you're, you're responsible enough. You're insightful enough. How would you do that? And I think, if, moms, if you can find opportunities to... As they get older, it's certainly age appropriate, all those kinds of things. Um, just say, I mean, how would you handle that? What would you do? Okay. 
So how does a wife promote independence in her husband? This is a tricky one, okay? We're not going to tread too deeply here uh, because you don't want to encourage your husband to go rogue. Um, but you also don't want a husband who always thinks you're going to second guess his decision. And that's tough when the husband's not got a good track record of making good decisions. Okay? Be careful. Don't point. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> No pointing, any of that kind of laser point. No, don't do it. But the husband never will if he feels like you're always going to have an opinion and second guess. Um, and and just, just walk that one. Walk that one carefully. Okay. Ruth, uh, Ruth chapter 1. Let's go back there again. And let's talk about the influence that moms have spiritually on children. Luke, uh, Ruth chapter 1. I don't know why I keep saying Luke. Probably because a U is in there. But anyway, Ruth 1, beginning in verse 15. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. And here's the most famous, most quoted verse from this entire, this entire book. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And she saw that this was, that she was determined. So when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Again, we're not going to delve into why Naomi kept insisting that, uh, that they go back there. But obviously, Naomi had had some spiritual impact on Ruth because in Ruth's statement, by saying, I'm going to stick with you and I'm going to stick with your God, Naomi had obviously said some things to her about her God. Even though she's had a really rough time because she feels like the Lord, that everything, you know, the Lord has not kept her from all these hardships. There must still have been enough positive communication about spiritual things and the God of Israel that Ruth said, I want that same God. That's her statement saying, Moab is a pagan nation. I want your God. That was her decision. So, um, moms, wives, you can have such an amazing impact um, and again, I think one of the things that, that Barb um, and Dan said, feel free to use from your family, so it's his fault. Um, no, I think one of the things that, that she has contributed is her family talked about everything at any time. Now, there's some subjects I wish they didn't talk about, especially during dinner, but they have no problem with that. And my family didn't talk about anything ever of significance. Okay. So this is, this is an adult group, and, and it's a G-rated statement, but here was the talk my dad gave to me, okay, the talk. If you have steak, why do you want hamburger? That was the talk, because we didn't talk about stuff. It was like 25 years later, I'm going, I bet you this is what dad's thinking about, okay? <laughs> okay? But Barb's family just talked about everything all the time, all at the same time. Her mom actually said at one time, does, does Doug talk? I'm waiting for a pause. I'm waiting for everybody to take a breath at the same time, and they don't do that. Okay, her family at meals, I don't think they breathe. But, but anyway, but Barb was so good, it was a natural part of our conversations at tables, at wherever, to just talk about spiritual things. Uh, and moms, you can have a tremendous, tremendous impact uh, on your kids for doing that. We have a New Testament example, 2 Timothy 1.5. Uh, let me just read it. Uh, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you. He's talking about Timothy. Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois. I'm going to have some things to say about grandmothers here in just a couple minutes. And your mother Eunice. And I'm sure it's in you as well. There was a lineage of spiritual impact from grandmother to mom to Timothy. 
And actually, women, your greatest influence might not be what you say, although what you say is really important. They're watching. Do you read your Bible? What's the priority of church? What's the priority of living and developing a godly lifestyle? They are watching that. Josiah, my five-year-old grandson, watches everything that we do. And if you had grandkids, you know that's, that is true. So they're watching you. They're watching how you relate to your husband. They're, re they're watching how you relate. Um, I was at Walmart returning something the other day, and a lady in front of me was going ballistic that the Walmart won't take back an ink cartridge that was already open. And she is going nuts. And I thought, I'm really glad your kids are not here to see that. But, but they're going to pick up on stuff. Okay. So what's involved in a wife having spiritual influence on her husband? Again, 1 Peter 3. Uh, we're not going to unwrap the whole idea of submission. But in that passage, it talks about the fact that husbands have come to know Jesus because of the way their wives live. So that's 1 Peter 3. Just a couple more. Uh, mothers and wives can offer good advice. Let me just summarize um, in about one sentence. Okay, what's happening here? They move back to Bethlehem. Ruth meets Boaz. They get married. They have a child. Okay, that's two and three. But in chapter two, Naomi gives some good advice about how um, they, uh, Ruth can be productive. So there's some good advice there. Um, in Ruth 2 as well, uh, Naomi is looking out for her safety. And here's some advice. Here's some things you should do. Here's some things you shouldn't do. Okay, those are important. Uh, Ruth 3, understanding the customs of the time and how Ruth, here's how you can get yourself a husband. Okay? And you have to look at Ruth 3 for that. So, moms, how can you offer godly advice? Proverbs 1.8 says this, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Here's a couple principles about godly advice, or about giving advice. Make sure it's godly advice. So if you're going to give advice, make sure it's really good advice. Make sure you offer advice tailored to each child. So we interact with Karen very differently than Kellyanne. And Kellyanne very different than Dave, and Dave very different than Ben. So tailor it to the child. Uh, don't offer it, offer it when it's not wanted. Maybe similar to this. You may have seen this. Love our new home. There's so much space. We have a guest room now. But we have ants. Expired. 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 Thanks, Aunt Bonnie. It's a lot of house. I hope you can keep it clean. <laughs> How many of you seen that Geico commercial? Yeah, it is plastered all over the place. They have so many hilarious ones. But yeah, here is an aunt who's giving advice that's not wanted. Don't give advice when it's not needed. And don't offer advice when it contradicts the authority of the husband. That's a tricky one. Okay? Because, of course, as parents of adult children, we have opinions about everything, okay? We have opinions about their marriage and the way they're treating their kids and all, we have opinions about all that. Just be real careful. We can undermine the authority of the husband uh, in the home with that. So just be careful with that. Um, so how can a wife offer advice to her husband? Yeah, I'm treading carefully here, okay? Uh, so let me just ask a few questions. Do husbands at times need advice? You're allowed to say yeah. yes, okay? Are many husbands not very great at taking advice? Yes, okay? So how do you do it? Three words, carefully, lovingly, and respectfully, and we're moving on. <laughs> yeah. This summer I'm married 40 years and I've learned a few things. Let's jump to Ruth 4. So if in your Bibles, flip over just a couple pages, Ruth chapter 4. I really do want to address grandparents. So grandmothers and grandfathers, you still have a vital ministry to perform. So Ruth 4, I'm going to start in verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, um, and this is just the women in the town, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. Uh, and may his name become famous in Israel. 
May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer for your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Interesting. So Ruth ends up in the family line of David. So Naomi is a mother-in-law. She's also a grandmother. And so Obed, uh, the word simply means a servant of God. So Ruth ends up being the great-grandfather of David. And in the line of Joseph, whose genealogy is given in Matthew, so in the line of the genealogy of Jesus himself. She's only one of four women listed in the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. So, grandmothers, if you are one, you already know how valuable you are. My mom is still alive. Uh, Barb's mom has passed. Um, but she loves doting on her great great grandchildren i think she has a great 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 now so there's like eight generations it's crazy she'll be 91 shortly but she still has an impact on even my kids so they'll call because they know that that she kind of likes to talk um, and they'll they'll talk for hours on the phone and there's something my mom can say that i can't say i may want to say it i may have said it but when mom says it, there's something about that. Your grandmoms, grandpops, you have a lot of impact. Information from a, a, a Census Bureau estimate. 2.4 million of the nation's families are maintained by grandparents who have one or more of their grandchildren living with them. An increase of 400,000 people, an increase of 19%. Since 1990, it's 7% of all families with children under 18 are being essentially run by grandparents. One half of grandchildren living in a grandparent's home are younger than six. When, when Barb's watched Josiah for the whole day, which doesn't happen often, but does come eight o'clock, she just sits in the chair. <sighs> It's, we don't quite have the energy that we did when we were, you know, 20 and 30 and on. Uh, but there's, there's just an impact that you can have there. What would we do without grandparents? If you're a grandparent, then enjoy it. Be, be a help. You can have such a tremendous impact on not only your children, but almost at that point, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So just a comment about uh, mothers to daughters, mothers to sons, moms. Um, it, it is, it statistically is, is valid. Um, moms, as much as your daughters say they don't want to be like you, they're going to be like you. Okay, I hear in Barb's cackle, and if you know Barb, you know what that is. <laughs> that is her mom, okay? That is her mom exactly, okay? Expressions that she'll use. I'm going, that's Ruth. Not this Ruth. <laughs> Barb's mom was named Ruth. Well, you are becoming just like your mom, okay? Um, so, it's just, it's what they're used to. It's what they're going to see. So, um, I'll do a quick thing with dads, because uh, I didn't catch all of Pastor Dancer who may have said it. Uh, but yeah, sons are going to end up acting like you. So, so my sons have watched from day one when they started to think about such things, how I've treated Barb. They have watched that. They've seen great examples. They've seen some not so great examples. Okay? But uh, moms, your daughters will watch you. Mothers to sons, you're giving them an idea of what their relationship should be with their wife. There's a huge impact that you still have um, on daughters and on, 
and on the sons. So, Naomi, thank you for giving us some principles that, that I think can kind of help us just realize moms, uh, grandmoms, mothers-in-law, um, the Lord has placed you in a position of great responsibility, but great opportunity. So, seek to put your families in the place where God is blessing. Look out for the good of your family. Encourage guided independence. Guided independence and independent thinking. Realize you can have a great influence spiritually. Offer good advice. And realize that grandmothers and grandfathers still have a vital ministry to perform. In God's eyes, family does still matter. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this example. I know you didn't wrote, uh, didn't have uh, it written uh, to give us a lesson. It wasn't the original intent, but Lord, I think there's some things that we can legitimately glean from that. And so Lord, I pray for all the moms, all the grandmothers who are here. Um, Lord, they still have, and, and many of the ladies here have sort of come alongside of um, other women and, and other girls. Lord, I'm going to include that in this as well. But Lord, I pray that you'd give them the strength to continue uh, to perform the, the awesome ministry what they have. Give them uh, insight to know how to, how to tread what often is really tricky waters. Um, the courage to make the right decisions, the, the godly character to be able to be the kind of example that you want them to be. And Lord, um, I mean, I just look back at my, my own life and go, what would, how would I be different if mom had not, um, and you know, on her side, completely unintentionally, but built some things into you know, my character and the way that I see the world. So Lord, I, I do pray for moms. I pray for, for grandmothers. I pray for all the women here, wives. Um, Lord, we thank you for the awesome ministry that they have. We thank you for the ministry they continue to perform uh, in the church as well. So many of, of the things that we at Valley do uh, have a great influence uh, from the women here. So Lord, we commit them to you and just ask that your spirit would continue to empower them to do the work you've called them to do. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You are dismissed.